Okay, so welcome everyone. My name is uh, Marcin Hruschel and I am a president of the Institute of the New Europe, uh, a Polish think tank based in Warsaw. And I will have the pleasure to moderate today's uh, debate about uh, the meaning of the war in Ukraine for the FRISIS initiative member countries uh, from the political, security and economic perspective. Uh, it's already one month since Russia uh, invaded Ukraine. Uh, I think that all of us uh, in the FRISIS region uh, has been shocked by the brutality of this invasion and we are thinking how to stop this war and support Ukraine. Um, but today uh, I would like to ask you as uh, the representatives of uh, different organizations uh, that, are, that are forming our FRISIS initiative think tanks hub um, about the challenges and threats in our region uh, in the light of the Russian aggression on uh, Ukraine um, from the perspective of your country uh, and your field of uh, expertise. Uh, I think that uh, it would be very interesting to learn about our different perspectives on uh, this issue. And uh, before I ask the first question, let me introduce our uh, today's guest. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, I would like to welcome Professor uh, Ognian Minchev uh, from Bulgaria. Uh, he's a professor of political science in the Department of Political Science at the University of Sofia. He's also executive director of the Institute of for Regional and International Studies. Um, an independent think tank providing policy analysis on regional and international security and cooperation in Central and Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, so uh, welcome, Professor uh, Minchev. Uh, I Thank you for the invitation. Welcome, uh, also welcome, uh, Dr. Hans Voboda from Austria, uh, president of the uh, International Institute for Peace. Uh, he was elected member of the European Parliament in 1996. Um, he was even vice president of the Social Democrat Group until 2012 and, and then president until 2014. Uh, and he was uh, particularly engaged in foreign enlargement and neighborhood policies. And uh, Mr. Svoboda is also president of the Vienna Institute for International Economics, uh, the Center of Architecture, the University for Applied Science, Campus Vienna, and the Sir Peter uh, Ustinov Institute. So welcome, Dr. Svoboda. Thank you for the invitation. We have also Dr. Mihai Sebe, uh, an expert uh, in Romanian and European politics uh, within the European Institute of Romania, where he is the head of European Studies Unit and also uh, associate editor uh, at the Romanian Journal of European Affairs. And uh, he obtained his PhD in political science at the University of Bucharest. So uh, welcome, Dr. Sebe. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Thank you very much. Uh, we also have an, an expert from Poland, Mrs. Julita Wilczek, uh, FRISIS Initiative uh, researcher, also a former deputy director at the Department of Innovation in the Ministry of uh, Development and Technology uh, of Poland, and also a former member of the board at the Sobieski Institute, so another Polish think tank, a graduate of international security studies from the University of St. Andrews. Welcome, uh, Mrs. Wilczek. Uh, uh, there is also Mr. Richard uh, Griveson with us, so uh, Deputy Director at the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies and um, uh, Research Associate at the Diplomatic Academy of uh, Vienna. So we have actually two representatives from Austria. Uh, and uh, Mr. Griveson uh, specializes in the economies of Central, East and South East, East uh, Europe with a particular focus on Turkey and uh, the Western Balkans. So I'm also very happy that we have this kind of perspective at our today's debate. Uh, good Thank you, nice to be here. Uh, and we have also uh, our guest from, uh, from the Baltic States. So Mr. Olaf Nickers is president of the Baltic Security Foundation and a senior analyst at the Jamestown. Foundation uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, has led the uh, Baltic Security uh, Strategy Project supported by the Baltic American Freedom Foundation 
and the Jamestown uh, Foundation. And currently he's also the director of the uh, Baltic Sea Security uh, Initiative. From 2001 to 2019, Mr. Olefs has also worked at the Ministry of Defense of Latvia. Uh, welcome, Mr. Nikers. Hello, everyone. And last but not least, I would like to welcome our guest from, from the Czech Republic, Mr. Roman Matza, uh, analyst at the Institute for Politics and Society at Prague, Czech Republic, uh, who is responsible for security and media um, and ICT issues. And Mr. Matza uh, studied international development studies at the Palatsky University in Olomouc. Also welcome, Mr. Matza. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, so I'm, I'm very happy that you have responded uh, uh, in, in such a number um, to, to, to participate in our debate so, so we can have so many different uh, perspectives. Uh, and first, uh, let me ask you about the challenges and threats uh, in our region, so the FRISIS region, in the light of the Russian aggression on Ukraine. From the perspective of your country, and also your field of expertise. And first, I would like to ask Mr. Nikers to answer this question as he's representing the Baltic states. Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, of course, in this situation, when Russia has started a major war in Europe, uh, all the countries around uh, are under the threat. Uh, if uh, Putin demands return to the security situation in Europe that was before NATO enlargement in 1999. It means that not only the Baltic countries, but also Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, Slovenia, Slovakia, Croatia, Romania, and Bulgaria are targeted by the Russia's offensive strategy. The Baltics uh, overall, overall are uh, quite exposed and vulnerable in front of Russia's military potential. And all the three countries have very limited war fighting capabilities uh, compared with Russia in number and uh, military technology available. Uh, in the case of full synchronization of Russian and, and Belarusian offensive, and taking into account Kaliningrad factor, Russia would be capable to compromise uh, Lithuanian and NATO defenses and the defenses of the Baltic countries by denial which also would affect providing any meaningful assistance uh, from NATO uh, to the other Baltic countries, from Poland through the Suwalki gap. Uh, this is why Lithuania is expressing concerns regarding Russia's military operations and develop deployments to Belarus, uh, for instance. <clears throat> and uh, as Belarus is becoming an integral part of Rus Russia's offensive strategy, uh, this should require adequate response in NATO, uh, considering um, uh, considering uh, not only defensive and reactive strategies, uh, but also proactive uh, courses of uh, action. Uh, so in this situation, uh, in response, the Baltic countries uh, and Poland uh, ultimately uh, should proceed with unprecedented military and security cooperation projects, for instance, organizing large scale military uh, training and also engaging uh, wider regional and, uh, and allied partners. Um, so, uh, in the wider regional security framework, uh, other uh, countries of the three seas initiative should be engaged. Uh, in order to succeed to fear and defense framework for the region, uh, not only Sweden and Finland should, should join NATO, that, that this, this is, this is uh, the thing that we see in, in the closest to the Baltic Sea region, uh, as uh, there are sound defensive capabilities uh, over the wider Eastern and Central European region, uh, but these uh, assets should be consolidated and focused along single regional security framework, uh, complementing NATO's collective security arrangement. So I see, uh, uh, I see Mr. Nikers, that uh, uh, you, as a representative of a Baltic uh, country, you are very much concerned about the sec security dimension uh, within this situation. And uh, I think that you are, yeah. you are mainly... Uh, 
uh, now uh, thinking about the, the NATO response, uh, whether the NATO will be able to secure uh, not only Baltic states, but also the Eastern Exactly. And how about the, the FRISIS initiative? Do you think that this initiative may also somehow ensure uh, the, the, the security or maybe stability of, of your region mm. as a uh, Baltic country? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, this is, I think, uh, for us, a, a, a kind of a um, last call uh, to fully utilize our uh, and develop our cooperation uh, instruments and arrangements within the uh, Three Seas Initiative framework. Uh, so everything what uh, I was mentioning about the security, about the military security, uh, goes also to the economic, economic, financial, and energy assets that are present in the region. Uh, so, so this framework uh, really should be should be utilized to uh, to ensure to develop uh, and strengthen our uh, our resilience uh, in in terms of in the wider sense of, of security over the region, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, so, thank you, thank you very much uh, for for this. Uh... Uh, for this uh, outlook. And now uh, let me ask uh, uh, Dr. Svoboda uh, what is uh, the Austrian uh, perspective uh, on this uh, conflict? Um, and uh, how do you think, what kind of challenges uh, it brings uh, to, to, your country, to your country as uh, Austrian? Yeah, thank you very much again for this invitation. I think in Austria, of course, we don't have this immediate uh, threat, of, don't feel this immediate threat. Uh, of course, it has effect uh, when, of course, the refugees. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, the economic consequences of that war, which will be strong, especially as Austria is very much dependent on, on Russian gas. Uh, and we have to switch, and we will switch, and we started already to switch, but this needs some time. But of course, other effects will be here. Uh, we don't know how Russia will react. Russia, of course, is still thinking, I think, what is better for them to go continue to, to deliver gas because they get money or to, to stop uh, the flow of gas in order to blackmail or put more pressure on other countries. And Austria, that sense, would be very vulnerable. Uh, but as you know, there are many other issues uh, in, in the economic ties and the sanctions and the aftermath and the consequences of sanctions will be, of course, also strong in Austria, who had traditionally a strong relationship with Russia, independent of, of Putin's uh, regime already before. You know that uh, Austria, after the Second World War, was occupied for about uh, 10 years uh, by different forces, the Allied forces, including, of course, Russia. And then there was uh, more or less a give and take when Austria said it would be neutral, it would decide neutral after all the troops left. Uh, so it's a decision by the Austrian uh, parliament. It's not based on a treaty, but nevertheless, it was given some sort of a promise to Russia. And again and again, now Russia, uh, because of the sanctions and the sa sanctions uh, Austria is, is following, is uh, at least saying that this is uh, violating Austrian neutrality and so on. So that's another issue we have to discuss as well with Ukraine. But maybe just one remark still. For us very much, uh, we are concerned about the Balkans. I've been recently also in, in Serbia, also from our institute, we do a lot of work on the Balkans. And I think uh, this is much be a major concern also for Austria that um, the, the involvement of Russia or the engagement of Russia and the Balkans had many negative effects. And of course, it could trigger again some turmoil in Serbia, in Kosovo, in Bosnia. So I think this is uh, something which is very much of our concern, the influence of Russia and the Balkans. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would like to have another like follow-up question because you said that Austria is heavily dependent upon the Russian gas. And we all know that now the, the European Union, but also uh, particular uh, member states are trying to diversify uh, the import of, of gas to cut it, uh, the, the imports from, from Russia. And is in the Austrian uh, public debate, um, 
um, this kind of idea that maybe the FRISIS initiative uh, may be helpful also in this regard, because um, this initiative is, is also very much focused on infrastructural projects, also uh, on uh, the gas uh, pipelines. So, so do you think that in this case, the, the FRISIS initiative may be helpful? And is it considered in, in the Austrian public debate in politics? Well, I, I must say this, this, this initiative has been mentioned here and there, but it's not a, a subject of widely, uh, uh, widely discussions. But I personally think, and this is one of the elements of, of our interest and engagement, is that, of course, this, this initiative, in a broader sense, can have some, some very positive effects. I still remember when I was a member of European Parliament, together with a Polish colleague from the other political side, we made a report on a diversification of gas and oil um, but unfortunately the council was not very happy or not very let's say active on doing that so diversification should have started earlier but now i fully agree with you that uh, the 3c initiative could be one element of that strategy of diversification and of new orientation uh, in the economic uh, relationship and finally also in the political and security relationship. Yes, so thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Svoboda. Uh, and uh, let me now ask uh, uh, Dr. Sebe, because uh, uh, Dr. Svoboda mentioned this uh, Balkan uh, dimension. So, so let me ask you about uh, the Romanian perspective. Uh, how much are you concerned with the situation in Ukraine? And do you also uh, think that uh, the, the war in Ukraine uh, may actually destabilize the situation in the, in the Balkans? Well, thank you very much for your kind question. And answer it very shortly. Yes, we are very, very concerned. And we strongly believe that uh, the crisis in Ukraine, the war should be solved as soon as possible before its spillover effects affects both the Republic of Moldova and the, Russian, uh, and the Western Balkans region. The Ukrainian crisis, in our perspective, has shown, uh, I in, have my intervention necessary on the military aspects, but on the regional cooperation, has shown that once more our speech about the importance of both regional frameworks of cooperation in Central and Eastern Europe as well as the strategic relationship, especially NATO and EU, is of utmost importance. Already, we have witnessed the development from uh, countries from the eastern flank of NATO of various initiatives for enhancing the resilience of the region. And uh, from that point, the Treaty Initiative or the BQRS9 format are of utmost relevance. Within the Treaty Initiative, the EU member states from the region, with the Adriatic, the Baltic, and the Black Sea, try to work together with the objective of increasing convergence and coherence in the region, as well as reducing the development gaps, gaps between the EU member states and the regions by investing in what is of our most important now, infrastructure, energy, and digital interconnectivity. And given these prerequisites, the Ukrainian crisis could and actually should enhance the regional framework of cooperation in Central and Eastern Europe in strong complementarity with NATO, while also trying to improve uh, their region connectivity with the Western Balkans. For instance, the three cities initiative that we mentioned a lot these days is such an example of initiative and the investment projects that Romania supports a lot, such as the Rail to Sea and the Via Carpathia project, may have on the medium term a significant impact on the region stability and resilience. Also, when we uh, analyze the impact of the Ukraine crisis, we need also to bring more the EU in the region, and we need to have this initiative and activities synergic with the EU agenda, the next generation EU, and most important, the transatlantic relation priorities. As the security evolutions in the region show that we uh, must accelerate all this development that have already started. Also, the BQRS9 format is of almost importance for the region. And uh, these two initiatives show that our countries are strongly dedicated to regional uh, framework of cooperation. There are also various multilateral formats that need to be uh, developed. And Romania and Poland, for example, have a very close dialogue 
and are key actors in the eastern flank of NATO. And uh, both countries have argued in the past about the need to increase NATO presence in the region long before the Ukrainian crisis uh, begins. And uh, the current crisis only accelerated the trends that our countries uh, supported. And we need to improve our cooperation in order to deal with the implication of uh, the crisis, either from refugees and from the aspect of energy and military cooperation. Also, one important aspect that needs to be emphasized now is the fact that we need to support the European perspective of Ukraine alongside the Republic of Moldova and Georgia. This will be, of course, dependent on the evolution of the security situation in the region. But given the strong commitments of our countries and of the regional initiative, I believe that the EU can do more in supporting the European part of Ukraine, the Republic of Moldova and Georgia. Also, another initiative that is on the agenda and, in my opinion, should be well follow up is the meeting in April in Berlin about the idea to create a support platform for the Republic of Moldova, Moldova support platform, where key European and world players will try and bring together in order to see how can we help the Republic of Moldova, either an aspect related to the economic crisis or the refugee ones. In my personal opinion, besides the obvious security aspects that are discussed nowadays, we should also try to prepare the condition for the uh, peace in the future. Because if you remember, for instance, the case of the Second World War, the peace negotiations started long before uh, Nazi Germany defeat. So what our countries do and what the, the regional initiative can do, besides the obvious, is to prepare the climate and the general framework for improving what's next. Because the crisis will end eventually, and we need to be prepared for the aftermath of the crisis, for the reconstruction of the Ukraine and also the reconstruction of the region, while also trying to apply the lessons that we have learned, either to the fight against information or, for instance, energy independence and so on. Mm -hmm. This will be my Thank first. You. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Sebe. And now maybe I will uh, switch uh, to, to Mrs. Uh, Julita Wilczek, because I think that uh, Dr. Uh, Sebe uh, said a very interesting thing and very important that we should now think about the future and how to rebuild uh, Ukraine after after the war, uh, also as, as the Free Seas uh, region. And uh, Mrs. Wilczek, uh, do you think that um, uh, the Free Seas Initiative can or should have a role in this process in uh, trying to support Ukraine uh, economically to maybe try to invite uh, Ukraine to its own ranks uh, and uh, try to, to build a strength, more stronger uh, economic uh, relies between, between uh, Free Seas region and Ukraine. Well, obviously, Ukraine has been um, set as one of the key partners for the initiative and for the Free Seas Fund, even be before the war, one of the key proponents of Ukraine being the strategic partner of the initiative uh, was the United States. But there were some members within the initiative itself that also supported um, Ukraine, um, closer cooperation with Ukraine. However, um, for the time being, it is impossible for Ukraine to join the initiative because the initiative only accepts EU members. So as long as the Ukraine is outside of the European Union, that's not going to be possible. However, I think it could be a very good start for the Ukraine to start working closer with the European Union as, as a whole, because these countries are much closer culturally, economically, and also historically to Ukraine than uh, Western Europe. So it will be much easier to, to find a common ground uh, for the cooperation. However, I'm not really sure if the, if the region can be a meaningful contributor to rebuild, to invest, to like, for example, for to, to bring more investment for a new infrastructure in the Ukraine, because the region itself for now struggles with finding the money just for the investment within the region. So. It would be very hard 
to delegate some of the money in the region um, somewhere else. But I guess it could be a vocal advocate uh, outside of the region, for example, on the on the broad European Union scale, or maybe even a global scale, um, to bring more money into the um, crisis region and Ukraine at the same time. Because um, frankly, uh, what would was the main challenge because of the war is that I don't really believe that uh, any global investors um, are now very keen to invest in the region because of this of the region's um, uncertain security situation. And uh, as a do you also consider in this regard the our region the the crisis. Uh, region in, in in terms of saying that the investors are now less attracted to, to, to support any uh, investment? Yes, to be honest, uh, I know it, it may be a hard blow, but um, to the outside of, uh, to, to countries and to invest to investors from outside of the region, there is not much difference between the Central Europe and Ukraine. They are considered very similar markets. So if the Ukraine is hit, we are hit as well. And it's not just this, it's uh, it's not about just infrastructure investment. It's also about creation of the new jobs. We already see countries, uh, companies not being very eager to continue with their previously um, planned investments in this, in this case. So I guess the whole region will be hit. And for example, it's gonna be a very particular problem for crisis initiative investment funds because so far the fund hasn't secured any global uh, investment. And um, the whole point of the fund is to bring money from outside of the region for infrastructural investment. And to be honest, I don't really, I don't really believe it's gonna be possible right now. Uh, and there are only, I think, two, three more years left uh, for, the, for the fund to fundraise money. So, and I don't think the situation is going to stabilize very uh, quickly after that. But that's one of uh, one of the challenges. The other challenge I see uh, for the initiative uh, uh, for, for the initiative uh, itself is that the war has proven that there is no um, one voice of the initiative. There are many still um, very deep divisions. Uh, and even after a month, we still haven't been able to cooperate together. You can see like one, two countries, maybe maybe four working together. So you can hear um, a countries of the initiative speaking loudly about the war and the situation, but there is nothing from the initiative. There is no regional voice. And I think it's very worrying because if we cannot come together now in this very dire situation, I don't think it's going to be that easy, you know, in the when there is no common threat. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Vilcek. Uh, so maybe now I will direct my question to, to Mr. Roman Mata as a representative of a Czech uh, think tank. Uh, do you think that uh, the perspective of the Czech government will now change uh, regarding the crisis initiative that uh, maybe the, the Czech government uh, will be more involved and see it as an actual uh, format that can actually uh, strengthen economic cooperation in our in our region? Uh, as as far as I know, recently Czech uh, Republic has, has promised to deliver some money to this uh, crisis initiative uh, fund. Um, but I'm asking also about about the future. Is this format uh, recognizable in the Czech Republic, and do you think that it has a future <laughs> in, in our region and in your country? Well, uh, it it is recognized by the by the Czech uh, government, but it that's true that Czech approach is uh, is a little bit cold. Yeah, because uh, Czech Republic is like uh, careful to these initiatives, uh, which can uh, be considered sometimes as toxic towards uh, Western Europe or Brussels. Yeah, and sometimes these initiatives, as we for for example, are 
uh, used by some politicians as uh, opposition to, to Brussels and uh, Western Europe. And uh, I think this is not uh, the goal of the Czech Republic. And when I, uh, if I could mention, for example, the policy statement of the new Czech government, yeah, because we had uh, last October, we had the elections, uh, there is only one phrase and this phrase is, we are committed to cooperation within the three C's initiative. Yeah. And I read this uh, statement as a, we will go with the flow, yeah, but we will be careful, we will be not so active. And if every, every side or every part as a Western uh, Europe or EU is okay with it, so we will join it. And this is, I think, uh, the compare, contemporary uh, Czech approach, but uh, since the since the Russian invasion started, yeah, so I especially check, uh, there are no meanings about uh, three C's initiative um, uh, in the last month, yeah, because for us now it's, it's not on the table, let's say, because uh, we had uh, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian refugees, yeah, and we, we understand this war, this, this is not war that Ukrainians are not fighting for Ukraine, but fighting for Europe. And as a country with the experience with the year 1968, uh, so we, we, we understand what is this, because uh, now it is like a special operation and the Nazification and in the year 1968. So it was also like a special operation about contra-revolution against communist party and as a prevention uh, before, as a prevention of the attack or invasion of the NATO. So same rhetorics and uh, so we, our, our goals are now uh, to to strengthen this eastern flank, our soldiers are in the Baltics, and uh, they will be also deployed uh, in Slovakia. And uh, we have, uh, as a sm smaller size country, we have we have big military support with the uh, to Ukraine and also humanitarian aid and so on. So, yeah, so it is it is uh, now on the table more than than the three C's initiative. Uh, thank you for, for this description. Uh, I was thinking that maybe the, the political climate that uh, has changed recently, uh, I mean, especially the relations between the Czech Republic uh, and Poland, uh, what we can observe is that uh, this relation has changed for, for better. Uh, of course, we all are aware that there were some, some struggles between uh, before, uh, but now this, this visit of, of the prime ministers of uh, Poland, Czech Republic, um, Slovenia was, uh, I think, very uh, a strong sign that we want to cooperate and be together as a, as a region. And maybe this will somehow um, make the, the crisis initiative uh, between also Poland and, and Czech Republic uh, more reliable. Uh, Definitely, yes. And now let me be, maybe ask uh, Professor uh, Minchev. Uh, about the Bulgarian uh, perspective and what kind of, of, of challenges or threats the conflict in Ukraine uh, bring uh, to your country. Uh, of course, uh, we are quite aware that the, the, that the perspective may be to some extent similar to the Romanian one, uh, but I'm also very interesting, uh, interested in, in what uh, uh, you think about uh, the, the, the impact of the war on, on Bulgaria and the whole Balkan region. Well, first, every step of success for Russia in Ukraine uh, is, a stes, is a step which uh, raises the challenges for uh, the security of the entire region and Bulgaria in particular. On the Balkans, uh, we have uh, a country uh, which is one of the two major allies of Russia in Europe. Serbia, apart from Belarus, is uh, the key ally of uh, Russia. And uh, this, uh, this position of Serbia matters much uh, throughout the region of uh, the Western Balkans. And Bulgaria is the only territorial corridor which can link uh, um, uh, Russia to Serbia, 
in terms of uh, major strategic plans for extending enlarging uh, russian strategic presence in the balkans as a whole so this is a strategic challenge for bulgaria definitely i just mentioned it uh, if you uh, prefer it i can i can elaborate further uh, on that secondly uh, bulgaria is of course very much affected uh, by uh, the consequences of this war uh, being a part of the black sea region uh, the Black Sea Aquatory uh, is uh, much more limited than the Baltic Aquatory, and this has particular consequences. The Black Sea is too small for major military challenges. And Russia does exactly uh, that kind of uh, expansion of military might in the Black Sea. The other big uh, power in the region, that is Turkey, uh, is uh, also uh, interested in raising its uh, naval power and uh, security security potential uh, in the Black Sea uh, because of its uh, complicated com complex relationships with Russia. On the one hand, they are partners and even allies in some aspects of their relationships. On the other hand, they are rivals and long-term rivals. Uh, that kind of that kind of growing uh, growing military presence on behalf of Russia and as a consequence on, on, as a consequence on behalf of Turkey uh, may actually raise the stakes for the security of the entire region and uh, Bulgaria in particular. Third, the energy issue. Uh, practically, practically, Bulgaria is uh, among the most dependent uh, countries on uh, Russian uh, energy supplies, uh, almost 100% of the gas supplies, uh, lion's share of uh, liquid uh, fuel supplies, and so on and so forth. And this has its consequences on the structure of Bulgarian politics and Bulgarian economy. Bulgaria is very much dependent, much more dependent than it is healthy for Bulgarian national interest. And it's difficult to simply say we have to reduce it. We have to reduce it consequently with major steps uh, uh, towards this direction. And of course, we can do it through the channels, also through the channels of the Three Seas Initiative. And I think that um, in terms of uh, energy infrastructure, in terms of all other aspects of infrastructure, which affect security. Uh, the north-south dimension of constructing, of creating new, new channels of energy cooperation will be one major source of reducing uh, Russian uh, energy, energy influence uh, and control uh, in Bulgaria. Uh, May I ask just, just one thing? Uh, because uh, I think that, that the FRISIS initiative was also uh, very famous because of this uh, opening of the LNG terminal in Croatia. Uh, do you also consider it as a source of importing uh, gas to Bulgaria uh, in order to diversify your imports from, uh, from, from the Russia? That could, be an, that could be an option, but uh, Croatia is a bit far from Bulgaria. Uh, we are much more interested in the um, successful uh, completion of the, the other LNG uh, terminal, which will be in Alexandropolis in Greece. Uh, and its supplies will be of much uh, uh, bigger importance uh, for Bulgaria, especially if we uh, um, complete this uh, um, uh, interconnector um, between Bulgaria and Greece in the middle of, uh, by the end of June this year then this LNG terminal will be definitely one source of major diversification of Bulgarian uh, gas supplies portfolio. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. So, so would you like to continue a little bit more, elabor elaborate on, on what you were saying, or we can now uh, make a pause and also ask uh, another participants? I'll be ready to answer the questions which may uh, emerge from what I said. Sure. So now uh, let me move to, to Mr. Richard uh, Griveson. Um, and also, I would like to ask you about uh, the perspective of Austria. Uh, but uh, let me also ask you about your opinion how to diversify uh, the, the Russian 
um, import uh, the, the 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 import of gas from Russia, uh, because as we know, Austria is also very much uh, uh, dependent. Uh, do you have also some kind of uh, ideas uh, from which direction uh, Austria um, may try to to, to import uh, gas for its economy? Well, I would uh, I'll talk actually about the three seas region in general rather more than Austria. So, so I'm representing representing an Austrian think tank. Uh, we specialize actually in Central and Eastern Europe, especially three seas region. So I feel more qualified in any way. Hannes, I think already gave a lot of, of the perspective from, from the Austrian side. So, I mean, I would say that this, um, I mean, in economic terms, there are different ways that the countries, the 12 countries we're talking about here are impacted by this war. But I think the most significant is the energy channel. I mean, the, the, the reliance on, on, on Russia for energy, in general, this explosion in energy prices around the globe, whether it's gas or, or oil or, or, or other, other types of energy, and also food prices as well. And so we're seeing inflation in this region that we haven't seen for a very long time. I mean, at least a decade in some countries, uh, it's, it's much more than that. So although, you know, it, it's true that there are lots of ways the region's been eco impacted economically, and lots of them are important, this is the most significant. So it speeds up, of course, this talk of, of an energy uh, transition and, and how to get away from that. I mean, I think there'll be different elements to it. I mean, I think at the moment, in the short term, it's whatever it takes. You know, that, that's my impression uh, from seeing from Vienna, but I think across Europe, and including the Three Seas region, whether that's coal, whether that's uh, discussions of turning nuclear power plants back on, whether it's gas from other sources, I think it's just wherever we can get it, because even if we stay as we are, you know, we don't ban imports of, of Russian oil and gas into the EU, if Russia doesn't turn off the taps on that side, we're still looking at extraordinary price increases. I mean, we've seen a quadrupling of the oil price, quadrupling of the gas price. I mean, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. And people are, are suffering, obviously. I mean, anyone who had an energy bill recently knows this. Um, and so I think it's whatever it takes to, to, to find the, the energy that we need. And that, as I said, goes for food as well. I think in the medium term, for me, what, what this really means is, is a huge push for the green transition uh, in Europe. Uh, and that will be probably especially important for, for a lot of the countries of the Three Seas Initiative. I mean, this is something our institute has done a lot of work on the, the, the green transition in Central and Eastern Europe, how it can be funded, uh, what the implications of it are for employment, for, for the energy mix. And I think in, in once we're past the acute immediate phase of this crisis, that's going to be uh, probably even more of a topic because in the long run, that is the way to reduce the dependence completely uh, on Russia for energy. But we know, and as I said, we've done a fair bit of research on this also at our institute, it's not an easy, simple process and it has a lot of costs uh, involved. But I think if we ever are going to reach a consensus to do this and be willing to pay those costs, uh, it is now. I mean, I think uh, uh, Ms. Vilcek said this uh, in, in a different context, but if not now, then, then, then we would never do it because the, the degree of, of, of threat and the, the urgency uh, is so high. Mm. But do you think that the FRISIS initiative format can som somehow help with this uh, diversification of uh, energy supplies? I mean, I think the, where the Three Seas Initiative, I think, is relevant in this debate is because what we find in our research, there is, of course, a big disparity. If we think about this transition, whether it's the level of reliance on Russia now in terms of, of gas, whether it's the difficulties and costs and challenges posed by the green transition, it is different in Central and Eastern Europe to Western Europe, mostly, with some exceptions, but mostly it is different. So I think in terms of a group which has particular interests in this transition, particular concerns, particular priorities, particular needs, uh, the Three Seas Initiative is probably an important forum because at the end, no, the, the green transition affects all, it affects the whole world, but there's a big part of it which is EU specific. And if, within the EU, the countries of Three Seas Initiative have a particular uh, perspective on this. And so I don't know if it, necessarily can help the transition, but I think as a forum, uh, as a group, which have uh, some lot of overlapping interests, and as I said, uh, and, and to go back to the original point about challenges and threats, I mean, 
that see maybe this green transition more as a challenge and a threat than most of the rest of the EU, then it can be a, a, probably a useful forum for exchange and combining of perspectives and interests in that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, Mr. Griveson. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to add that I think also in this area of uh, green and energy transition uh, in the Frisis region, um, there are many different uh, voices and, and many different uh, perspectives. Uh, uh, for example, Poland is very much concerned about the, um, the tempo of, uh, of, of the energy transition, the, uh, how, how quick it's, it's going. And also I think there are differences in terms of how uh, the nuclear energy uh, should be used in, in our uh, energy sector. Uh, but as as far as I understand, you you also are trying to say that uh, this kind of format is actually helping to uh, try to discuss this, those issues and try to find some compromises and and common position uh, towards the the Western uh, Europe. I mean that that could be. So I mean, one of the things we find in our research, in the end, in terms of readiness, preparedness for this green transition, the ability of companies of governments to meet the, the needs, meet the criteria of the green transition, there's a pretty high correlation with level of economic development uh, and industrial structure and the recent economic history. So of course, especially the countries of Northwestern Europe are in a particular position. They see this in a particular way. Countries of Central, East, Southeast Europe see it in general differently. The, 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 the costs of this transition are in general going to be higher. So in that sense, um, even if, yeah, of course, there are differences between countries, every country sees it in its own way. The, um, I mean, one example would be the Just Transition Fund. You know, the, the, the priority of countries further to the east, further to the south in Europe is, of course, that this needs to be funded. This is a huge societal transition. It's a big shock, uh, the green transition uh, in economic terms and social terms, and it needs uh, proper funding to, to, to ease the costs. And in that sense, I think the, the perspective of, of Central and Eastern European countries should be fairly well aligned. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Griveson. Uh, so, so maybe now uh, let's try to move to the, to the second round uh, because uh, our uh, goal in this debate was also to establish whether uh, the war in Ukraine can catalyze uh, the development of cooperation among uh, FRISIS initiative states uh, from the political, economic and security perspective. I think that we have already and partially, or at least some of you tried to answer to, to this question, uh, but maybe let's uh, try to do it in a more structured way. And uh, let me ask uh, Mr. Nickers um, uh, from, from Latvia, whether uh, you think that this initiative can maybe also be developed more in the direction of, of security, uh, which is uh, from the perspective of your country, as, as far as I understand now, the most uh, important issue. So maybe do you consider uh, the, the FRISIS initiative as an important uh, format bringing security, not only the security uh, in terms of energy supplies, in terms of infrastructure, but maybe hard security. Should these this countries of FRISIS initiative uh, cooperate more in security issues? Uh, absolutely. Uh, this, in this situation, this is the, the, the basic, uh, the main issue of what we are facing here. And, and when we are really looking forward to the like credible answers, credible deterrence uh, measures um, along with the collective security arrangement. And the, the first thing we are looking forward is to, uh, is to inter-regional and, and regional cooperation. Uh, as, as, as I mentioned, uh, it's, ult it's ultimately uh, uh, the first thing for us is to to understand uh, that, uh, that 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 in this situation we are uh, we are threatened we are we are facing this threat not only the Baltic countries uh, and uh, not only uh, I would say Poland but uh, but but all the participants of the T6 initiative uh, uh, 
project and, and B9, as it was mentioned. So uh, for us, uh, is, is, it is really uh, is, is our responsibility in this situation to, uh, to, uh, to strengthen these arrangements uh, in the region. I, I already mentioned uh, uh, these, uh, that which is, 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 is uh, necessary uh, at first hand for the Baltics to strengthen cooperation with Poland. Uh, the, 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 that, that would require the, the most measures in terms of synchronizing uh, our uh, defenses over this uh, space, of, over the separational space across the Baltic Sea. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we are looking forward to, to, to closest to, to much closer arrangements and cooperation projects with other uh, three seas initiative countries. And, and so we are really thankful to those our NATO partners in NATO who are, who are already uh, part of the enhanced forward presence mission in the Baltic countries. Uh, and at the same time, uh, there is a uh, there is a way there is a way ahead. There is there is there is still space uh, for us uh, within the NATO and uh, and 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 and, cross in, 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 and and through the cross organizational um, uh, in cross organizational terms as well uh, to broaden this, uh, this 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 regional. This wider regional uh, cooperation. Uh, so it's it, for for us for the three Baltic countries. We are already there. We understand this synchronization is really we, we can go forward with it without that. So three Baltic countries are really should synchronize their defenses and everything. Then the next step is uh, it, it goes to Poland and the Baltic states and of course the wider region. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Nickers. And now maybe I will ask Mrs. Wilczek, as an uh, expert of the uh, FRISIS initiative, uh, actually its development. Uh, do you think that there is um, a room, a space for, for maneuver and uh, whether the, the FRISIS initiative can go more into this uh, security uh, dimension, uh, not only energy or not only uh, economic security, but also uh, the military one, if, if, if this kind of uh, ideas uh, has been already raised in the, in the FRISIS initiative format, and uh, is, it, is it possible at all? Well, I, I think it's possible, but we have to remember that the initiative started, uh, well, focused on um, infrastructure investments because it was so hard to cooperate um when it comes to political and um, military policies so the potential is there um we have nine of 12 countries um on the on the eastern flank of the nato so so-called Bucharest group but um and uh, but to be honest i guess it's still as we as we can see um for, for the last as we could have seen for the last month, it's still very hard to overcome the differences and to um, bring the policies closer together in the, even when it comes to just one question and the question is Ukraine here. But I think that since the topics that are already discussed, meaning the um, economic cooperation around energy, cyber uh, digital investment and uh, transportation, um, they're basically, they are already uh, security and geopolitical issues, even if we are not ready to admit that. So I think there is a potential, but it would be, it, it requires um, one key uh, thing, one key um, event to happen. And that means that, um, Poland right now is too um, is dominating too much the narrative. There is not much space left for the regional narrative, and of course it's um, it's uh, natural for Poland to be the leader 
um, in this crisis because it's the biggest country, it's the direct neighbor of Ukraine. It took the most um, of the of the refugees, but um, it is kind of um, uh, killing the initiative itself. Um, Latvia right now is a presiding country, and we don't really see um, much of it. You know, we don't really see much presiding on Latvia's side. I could imagine if, if Poland was on the, in, in Latvia's place right now, the initiative probably would be used much more. But since uh, it's not, I guess the Poland is just too concerned about being, you know, the leader here and not really allowing other countries to. Uh, to, to raise their concerns. So I think that it would be best for the initiative to, to bring other issues to the table, but um, it would be very difficult unless the whole region would be, uh, uh, would be, um, would be of the same importance. Because right now it seems like Poland is just trying to have everyone agree on doing whatever the Poland wants everybody else to do. And we could see that uh, clearly with the peace mission, no, nobody really <laughs> discussed this first on the regional level. And it was suddenly just brought up by Poland in the, in the, um, in the recent visit to Ukraine. And I think that's what's killing the potential expansion of the issues that are discussed within the, within the FRISIS initiative. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Vilcek. Uh, I think, uh, in, in fact, that uh, this, this idea to, to organize a peace mission uh, in Ukraine, um, I think it is a very good issue to be discussed within the FRISIS initiative countries in order to, to, to try to combine the, the support and get together the support of, of these uh, countries. Also, towards other uh, NATO uh, members and European Union members. Uh, but also let me ask uh, Dr. Svoboda, uh, what do you think about this uh, security uh, dimension? Uh, do you think that uh, now Austri Austria is, is ready also to uh, invest more in its uh, defense uh, capabilities? Uh, of course, we, we know the issue of neutrality, but um, do you think that uh, facing this, this challenge that the Russia is, is posing, uh, do you think that something m may change uh, in this respect in Austria? Yes, indeed. Uh, the Austrian government in principle already decided to step up the military expenditure. Uh, what we need, of course, uh, we must be very careful in the sense of uh, every country is spending more money, uh, but is it really done efficiently? Uh, first of all, I would say we should not double things or triple things. We have the NATO, uh, it's here, and uh, it would be very good if NATO would uh, uh, coordinate its, its policy, uh, especially its armament programs and so much more. Then we have the Euro European Union. Here again, it is important uh, to step up uh, the different uh, um, uh, defense policies. Uh, we know perfectly well that we speak since years about uh, coordinated defense policy, but we didn't get it. So why should we create another uh, element inside uh, the European Union? I think uh, what has been said before already, it is very important because uh, to have a united European position on this uh, issue, because otherwise for Russia, it would be the best if uh, there is a new division in it. And I think security in this military sense is first of all NATO and secondly, it's also European Union and then in coordination with the countries who are not member of European Union. If, for example, we discussed it quite strongly and uh, Richard uh, underlined it, if we have this kind of diversification on, on gas and, and oil, and if we have the green transition to get independent, that's the most important issue of uh, security policy because security is not guaranteed if you're much too dependent on one country to give you the basic elements you need for your industrial and economic development. So I think that that's very important. And, and another issue which may be lead to, to the third question, but I want to uh, say principle already now, 
if you look where are the most vulnerable countries, the Baltic still, of course, are quite vulnerable. They are relatively small. They have a member of NATO, so they are safeguarded. And the US uh, made very strong pledges now, not with Mr. Trump, but now. But the most vulnerable countries are what has been mentioned, Moldova, Moldova. Uh, it's neither NATO nor the European Union, nor Three Seas Initiative, and the countries in the in the Balkans who are not members of the Three Seas Initiative. So what we have to think with the Three Initiative, with their overall principal security issue is, how can we involve countries, and of course, the, the question is with Ukraine, who are the most vulnerable countries adjacent to the Three Seas Initiative countries? Now, uh, as it has been mentioned, they, they cannot uh, become members in that sense, but our, our work in the three initiative must include, in, indirectly at least, the neighboring countries who are very much uh, vulnerable. As I said, Moldavia and the Balkan countries, maybe you add, can add even Georgia. So I think um, have, we have so much to do to uh, bring the stability into this region uh, that we should not double things which has to be done and have to be done in uh, in NATO and in the European Union uh, and in the member countries. And again, to come finally to your question, yes, we will have to step up, but it is very important, especially on cybersecurity and other issues, cooperation of intelligence and so on, that we do it together on a European level in order to spend the money efficiently. It's not only to spend money, but to spend it efficiently in defending our countries and our values. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Svoboda. There is uh, always the question uh, of the uh, complementarity between the, the Free Seas Initiative and, uh, and the European Union. Um, and of course, uh, the, the question of uh, uh, on what format the money should be spent more efficiently. So, so thank you for, for this, uh, this voice in our discussion. And le let me come back to Professor Minchev. Uh, what do you think, whether uh, from the Bulgarian perspective, the FRISIS initiative uh, can be considered as another important format in terms of providing security, uh, but defined in a very broad way, as, as Dr. Soboda uh, proposed, uh, or it's just uh, like doubling uh, other initiatives which are already uh, there, like uh, the NATO. Practically every initiative uh, in the field of security is welcome, provided that it, that it has particular chances to uh, reach uh, practical results. Uh, we are living for quite a while now in a practical paradox. Uh, the European Union, the European countries uh, in the European, members of the European Union, uh, represent uh, about anyway more than four, 400 uh, million people. Uh, the first economy in the world taken together uh, before before uh, Britain departed, I'm not sure whether this is so now. Uh, and we, as we all know, uh, Europe has uh, always been uh, practically uh, helpless to deter and to stop uh, all those uh, mm, uh, steps that uh, mm, the Kremlin regime made uh, in 2008. Uh, uh, in 2014, uh, thanks God, today uh, we are much more united and uh, resisting uh, uh, what happens with the war in uh, Ukraine. Uh, so uh, what we owe to ourselves uh, in the European Union, uh, in, the European, in, in the community of European nations, is to take care about our security, probably not as a kind of a uh, mirror image of the NATO, uh, doing what NATO is being it has, has has been doing for 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 many years now, but to try to reach particular particular consensus on uh, the core interests, the core security interests of the European Union, uh, which core interests could be defended uh, 
in case of an aggression as we now having uh, of Russia against Ukraine and in all other cases uh, in which uh, practically European security as a whole uh, has been challenged. Now we have to remember that in 2015 we had a huge migration problem in Europe which actually caused deep division within uh, among the European the European countries in terms of their policies uh, towards this uh, migration wave, uh, refugee migration wave. Uh, and we will obviously have more and more challenges like that, like the migration wave in 2015, like uh, uh, the occupation of Crimea a year earlier in 2014, and, uh, and uh, with the war that started now uh, um, of Russia against, uh, against Ukraine. Uh, so uh, producing, producing a joint uh, uh, understanding of interest uh, and uh, agreement on uh, uh, how we can pursue our security through this definition of joint interest seems to me seems to be to be vital uh, for the development of uh, uh, the European Union uh, and the three C's initiative uh, of course could contribute to that because uh, uh, Russia and uh, the imperial the imperial ambitions of Russia. Uh, we'll be here to stay uh, not for a year or two, but for a longer period of time in a uh, longer term perspective. Uh, and the countries of Central and Eastern Europe uh, uh, will have today uh, to, to, to have their own, their own voice in, uh, in defining that threat and uh, proposing to the European Union, to the community of the European nations as a whole, particular steps to deter that kind of a challenge. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Minchev. Maybe I will also now ask uh, Dr. Sebe about the, the Romanian perspective, uh, also as a, a country who is one of the uh, founding member of the Bucharest 9. Uh, do you think that the FRISIS initiative uh, can be some, somehow uh, useful in this security uh, dimension, um, taking, uh, taking into account uh, the energy sector and taking into account the, the transportation, the uh, cyber warfare, and also this military aspect. The three Cs is of utmost importance because it allows to connect various parts of Europe and uh, the seas and allows us to focus on what is important. As you mentioned, infrastructure, for instance, we just realized that we need to be more connected. And for that, we need to have more flexible approaches than necessary in the EU side. For instance, uh, today uh, our prime minister had a meeting with the Bulgarian counterpart, North Macedonia and uh, Montenegro. And, and one of the questions discussed there was a question of energy connectivity, especially the Bulgaria, Greece and Romania, and also ways to improve connectivity in the regions. And from that point of view, the three seeds can bring this integrated perspective because we need to, in a way, create a sort of military Schengen in the region that would allow and facilitate the mobility of all sorts of goods and also, if the case needed, uh, security forces. And also, the three seeds can provide the necessary umbrella for developing energy independence of the region. Uh, Romania has uh, long been advocated, for instance, of increasing the energy and the nuclear energy as an important way to tackle the, what we already perceived a long time ago to be a strategic dependence on outside uh, suppliers. And from that point of view, the three seas can provide a like-minded platform of the region when, where we can bring together people that support uh, this sort of initiative. Also, I tend to believe that the three seas can provide for uh, foreign investors, the necessary framework that will facilitate, for instance, the location of uh, factories and other investments from east to more east to the west of the continent and can provide the necessary interface between uh, Western European countries and uh, the eastern one. From that point of view, the three seas initiative can only go up and if properly developed and uh, use this platform, can provide the necessary, let's say, resilience and the necessary the convergence means of the Eastern and Central Europe and also other countries in the region in order to join the 
more developed EU member states. Also, the three Cs can facilitate the economic competitivity of the region as a whole, because a lot of our economies have similar problems and uh, struggles. And from that point of view, an internal harmonization within the three Cs may help us in the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Seba, and uh, I think that uh, you you have brought uh, a very important aspect to the discussion that uh, because of the sanctions imposed on on Russia uh, by by the European Union, but also America, uh, Great Britain, and and many Western countries, um, we will see now the the flow of uh, many companies out of of Russia. Uh, and uh, those companies uh, will have to somehow find another place. Uh, so, so from this perspective, uh, the Frisis region also looks as a very good alternative, uh, uh, so to say. Yes, Dr. Sebe? That's why the fact that this trend is not necessarily a new one. Actually, even since the pandemics, we realize the fact that we need a reorganization of our uh, supply lines, of our strategic uh, dependencies, and so on. So basically, the Ukrainian crisis only accelerates a process that started since the pandemics and even before the pandemics on relocating uh, key industries and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Actually, it's only a continuation of already started policies. Uh, so maybe I will now ask uh, Mr. Uh, Griveson uh, about this issue. Uh, do you think that, uh, that the Frisis Initiative uh, in this respect may be uh, useful and helpful to try to actually bring those uh, companies which are leaving now Russia because of sanctions to settle down uh, in uh, our region. Uh, do you think that the initiative may somehow um, discuss this, this issue and make the members of the initiative try to, to, um, to put a proposal for, for these companies uh, to settle down uh, in our countries or do you uh, uh, have this kind of uh, impression that there will be a harsh competition actually between different um, member states to attract those those companies uh, which uh, are leaving and I think that uh, more and more factories will, will, will start to, to move or at least stop in Russia and start to be built in, in our region. So I, I agree with the basic point. I think that is what is happening. And I also agree with, with Dr. Sebi that it's, it's, it's an intensification of something that was happening anyway. I would take it back further. I would take it back to Crimea. Mm -hmm. I think the high point of truly Eurasian integration was 2014. And this, after the sanctions, the annexation of Crimea, you saw this, a gradual disentangling of economic and financial integration between Russia and the West, in, a, in the West in a very broad sense. So you see that if you look at different indicators of trade integration, financial integration between Russia and the EU or, or Russia and, and Europe in general, rest of Europe in general, the high point was really 2014. Now, of course, this is a massive intensification of that. It was a slow drip, kind of slow process, this disentangling, and now we see it extremely fast speeding up. I would say it, it the pandemic, of course, accelerated it, but this this war is is a totally is a total game changer. The the level extent of sanctions, the speed of sanctions, and then all of these companies that are just choosing to leave, they don't necessarily have to, not because of sanctions, they just choose to be to be out of Russia. So it's a very major thing. Now, what do they do? I think what started to happen in 2020 was companies became very worried about extended supply chains. They didn't like in the pandemic having all this insecurity where goods have to cross borders lots of times, you have investment you know, in a different continent even. And we saw this process of so-called nearshoring starting. So the example being, say a German company still wants to put the labor intensive production in another country because labor is relatively expensive in Germany, doesn't want to put it so far away. So it will put it in Serbia or Bulgaria or, or Turkey instead. I think the major, so in, in putting all of this together, I think the major advantage that the 3C countries have, and we've mentioned this now a few times, is, is the EU membership. Because for a foreign investor, the EU membership is still a, a massive thing. It's, it's, a, it's an enormous advantage that the countries we're talking about here have versus, say, the Western Balkans or Moldova or, or Turkey or, 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 or you know, pre-war times uh, Ukraine. And that will remain, I think, an enormous advantage. So while I agree, somebody made the point earlier that 
of course, investor sentiment takes a hit from this. You know, today, seen from today, it's probably less attractive to invest in Estonia than it was two months ago. You would probably have, have some doubts. But I think on a two, three year time horizon, if this crisis leads to a reinforcement strengthening of NATO, ever clearer, US, some sort of a winding back of what we thought was a US withdrawal from Europe in, in a security sense, then I think you can't see a case where these countries, the countries that we're talking about now, can actually benefit from more uh, investment in the future, putting uh, putting all of this together. I would say, so, though, that I think that some of these hopes about the nearshoring are a little bit overdone. Uh, I'm not convinced it's going to be completely a game changer. There will be still plenty of, 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 uh, of companies that want to or need to invest in Asia. And I think that then brings a question which you all as, as political scientists and geopolitical thinkers can probably answer better than me because the question of how much is, does this remain a Russia West conflict and does it spiral into a, a really global uh, China US, a, an element of, of a broader China US conflict. And if that happens, then I think the, the implications also from an economist perspective about economic growth, trade, globalization, investment decisions of multinational companies becomes then a completely different discussion. I mean, and it's a much more uh, dramatic impact. But if we stay with the situation where we are now, we assume nothing dramatically changes in Russia, you know, no sort of radical regime change, then I think this, this hardening in economic terms is harder to divide, which, as I said, started in Crimea. It's, it's almost a decade old now. Um, will become much, much harder, and, and, and the, the, these economic links will be more and more unwound. And then maybe more companies will choose to put uh, investment uh, into some of the, of the three seas countries. Mm -hmm. And do you believe that the initiative will be able to, to bring some, some joint proposal or some kind of, I don't know, common policy to attract those uh, companies leaving Russia? There, I would, uh, I would be quite skeptical. I mean, uh, as I said, I think, I mean, the countries we're talking about here have the huge advantage of, of EU membership. It, it's an enormous thing. But we know between them, they do compete. We see it a lot, the, the competition for foreign uh, investment uh, between them. Because, I mean, if you're making, a, in, in a very basic sense, if you're making an investment decision between Slovakia and Hungary, uh, the, those economies are quite similar. You know, there isn't a great, huge advantage to one over the other in, in looking purely at the numbers. So then it does come down to a lot of competition between them, uh, incentives, maybe some political factors as well. And so I think that's what we've seen in the past is more the competition. And um, I would expect that to be the case in the future. By the way, just to mention on because this is a discussion often about the Western Balkans, you know, which individually are very small countries. Maybe they should co uh, cooperate more to attract big investments as a whole. And unfortunately, it's very much the same story there. We see much more, the reality is much more competition than cooperation in attracting investment. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Griveson. Uh, and now uh, uh, the same question for uh, Mr. Mata. Uh, about this uh, this this uh, security dimension of the um, FRISIS initiative, uh, can it be strengthened? Uh, should it be strengthened? Uh, but also, uh, I would like to uh, know your opinion about uh, this uh, idea to to attract uh, investors uh, who are, of course, uh, leaving uh, Russia, but also these companies uh, leaving Russia. Do you think that? Uh, the uh, FRISIS initiative may be, and the FRISIS region may be a good place for, for them, and uh, whether the Czech Republic is actually doing something in this, uh, in this regard, trying to already attract some, some, some companies. Well, uh... because I think we are also uh, thinking about it, that, but a lot of companies uh, are, are looking for its place because it couldn't operate anymore in Ukraine for, for the obvious reason. So I think that it also has this both effect. Well, about, about the first uh, question, uh, when we look at the map, so uh, this three seas region is a, like a <laughs> form, uh, part of former Soviet Union or this uh, Moscow buffer zone, Eastern Bloc. Yeah. 
and it's it's natural the the closer you you live uh, to Russia so you have uh, less positive approach towards Putin's Russia and uh, worse experience historical experience you have and uh, from this security uh, dimension I, I see that uh, in the security terms, it can be like a fruitful cooperation based on this, uh, what was mentioned already, uh, this uh, energy security, cyber, also uh, also transportation. Yeah? When we speak about the strengthening of Eastern flank, so we speak about the uh, military mobility. Yeah? And it is also strengthening our defense, but from the defense perspective, uh, I see it as a more, more informal alliance, yeah, because from this experience, our uh, approach towards Russia, uh, which is uh, based on our historical and not only historical experience, so different uh, view on Russia or Putin's Russia, to be precise, is in, for example, in Portugal or Malta than in uh, Latvia or Estonia, yeah. So we see some like informal alliance of of uh, from the countries of this uh, three seas region uh, when we see this military supplies uh, to Ukraine, for example. Yeah. So I think it's uh, it's uh, natural, but it's uh, not official, and I think it should be not kind of official. Yeah. And to your second questions uh, about the investments, uh, when we see the global companies like leaving uh, Russia and these global companies produce for uh, Russia internal market. And I think these global companies uh, already exists in uh, free seas countries. Yeah, so it doesn't mean that if in Russia changed McDonald's to Uncle Vanya, that Jaja Vanya. So we we have to build like a, we we have to build new McDonald's in our countries and so on. And uh, it was the the, the the production of of these companies for Russian was for Russian internal market and this import from Russia was only gas and uh, oil. Yeah, so. I think there is uh, not uh, such a such a big uh, big space for a new investments, and um, I, I don't see it like real that the global company, uh, the factory in Russia is closed and it will be moved to Latvia and it will the the, the production from Latvia it will be sent uh, to Russia. So it's I, I don't think in this uh, world of sanctions. Uh, when the task is to like isolate uh, Putin's uh, regime is is not uh, reasonable, yeah, but uh, I think there is there is still thoughts, there is uh, some space uh, to attract uh, new investors um, because if they will not invest in Russia, investors from Asia, for example, they can invest in uh, for for in uh, let's say Central and Eastern Europe, but also, we should be we should be careful because, uh, for example, uh, investments from China are also, let's say, problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, Mr. Matza. Uh, I think that that slowly we are coming to to the end of our discussion. Uh, if you would like to say something uh, to to conclude, some kind of uh, wrapping up. Uh, statement uh, please uh, uh, let me know uh, we still have a little bit of time uh, uh, from my side i can i can say that what is emerging from our discussion uh, is that uh, the the frisis uh, initiative uh, can actually uh, strengthen its role as a provider of security but security understood in a very broad way uh, also mainly about the energy security, about the uh, security of uh, uh, trade, uh, but at the same time what appears uh, from our discussion is, is this uh, kind of uh, um, feeling that uh, some investors uh, from around the world may uh, consider our region as uh, 
less stable and therefore there are some kind of threats that uh, uh, there will be more there will be less money coming to to our um, um, region of the of the free seas so so this situation i think uh, has some advantages and of course uh, uh, threats uh, on the um, on the horizon and i think that maybe here is this uh, um, the space for a political decision and the ability to somehow uh, provide political guidance and uh, use this format as a way to, to discuss common issue to, to, to show um, to the outside world that, that the region will remain stable, that we will work very much in terms of uh, energy sector. Um, I think also in this uh, uh, interconnectors on the border, which are now becoming very, very much important uh, thing in terms of uh, our um, energy policy. So, so uh, I think that these are my um, conclusions, but please, if you would like to add something, we still have a little bit of time. Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Svoboda and then uh, Dr. Sebe. Thank you. Uh, I think the issue of uh, relative independence, uh, economic independence of the region as a whole, uh, in framework, of course, of the European Union is very important. Now, Russia, of course, is in the center of it, uh, especially with the gas and and also some other materials, uh, nickel and other uh, elements. It's not only gas, uh, fertilizer, for example, but there also has been mentioned also the issue of, uh, of grain and of, of food prices. But uh, as mentioned, the, the, the colleague from, from the Czech Republic, it's also about China. Now, China, of course, is in a different position. It's not uh, as aggressive, uh, at least towards Europe, as, uh, as Russia. But nevertheless, I think, the overall relatively, let's say, depend, independence of the region should be enhanced and should be discussed. Uh, so I think that some politicians have been too naive concerning China and Chinese investments. Uh, and I think I just wanted to add to that. But my real question would be how, or maybe you can at the end state, how we will continue our work. Uh, are we in some way connected to the meeting, I think, in Riga, or is that uh, totally independent from our work? Are we meeting somewhere in Poland or somewhere else? So I think uh, maybe at the end you could uh, make it clear what's your intention uh, is how we should proceed with our work. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm, I'm very you. happy, Dr. Svoboda, that you are also bringing uh, this issue uh, in because uh, uh, this debate is, uh, as, as some of you already know, uh, the, the, the official initiation of our uh, free season think tanks hub. So um, we would like to cooperate uh, closely as uh, different uh, think tanks from, from the free season member states. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, this kind of debates are a uh, very good way how to share opinion, how to also present our perspective. And I, I think that we can also try to uh, think about uh, more actions uh, about being present at the different uh, uh, conferences and events in the in our region to also try to to, to represent a common um, statement or common position. And uh, Dr. Sebe and also Mrs. Vilcek. I say concluding remarks. I believe that EU initiative can also play a strong role in enhancing the accession process of uh, the Western Balkan countries of the new country countries because the countries uh, from this initiative have the common uh, background, have the same uh, enlargement problems that uh, the candidate countries are now facing, and you can provide this sort of expertise to this sort of maybe a twinning process that may assist uh, both candidate and upcoming candidate, potential candidate countries. And from the point of view, the know-how of the countries in the region can also be put to use uh, by providing, let's say, this uh, treasure of knowledge and how to do things in regarding the EU session. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sebe. And now this is uh, Vilcek, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> I think it's also important for the region to come together to make sure that the, that the West will not forget the lesson that we all learned during this crisis, meaning that not to be dismissive of our interest and our 
um, expertise when it comes to Russia and the, the post-Soviet regime, because we've been observing this for the last 10 years, 20 years maybe even, that um, often when the countries of the region are taking an active stand, they are being criticized even openly for, for having a different opinion than their uh, Western partners. And I think it's, uh, well, enough is enough. We, we have proven that the Western politics has been very disruptive for, for, the, for the situation, not only in, in Ukraine, but for the whole region. And I think it's important to make sure that this lesson will not be forgotten because once the crisis is um, resolved, I think it's gonna be very easy to for some countries to call for reinstatement of the, um, of the of the business as usual with Russia. And I think it's very, very dangerous. And we've seen this uh, before. So I would, uh, I think it's important for for the region to, to do it as one, because if the only will be one country uh, mentioning this, it's gonna be much more easier to uh, dismiss this kind of opinion. Mm -hmm. so, so, so you also propose uh, like a stronger political voice, if I'm not mistaken, from the Frisis initiative uh, at the European level, yes? Yes, at least when it comes, you know, to making business with Russia, because of mm -hmm. course it can still be about the economic cooperation, doesn't have to be about the politics. But uh, as we have learned, as we, as, as we have warned for many years, there is no real business. Um, there's no just business with Russia. Every business is about some political choices and they are not always the be in the best interest of, the, of some countries in the region. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Vilcek. And now, Mr. Nickers, uh, the final word uh, from you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for this uh, great discussion. Uh, of course, uh, I think we can agree, all of us, that there is a, a tremendous potential uh, to address uh, the broadest uh, issues, uh, security terms at the regional dimension. And uh, so many times there, uh, we hear on energy security, uh, dependence on Russia's energy supplies, uh, case of Bulgaria and others. And this is, uh, this is, this can be uh, one of the thing that, uh, as we hear this, this uh, north, north, uh, south direction, uh, that those solutions, which we also being highly dependent on Russia's energy, let's say, uh, that, that they're looking uh, for the ways to, uh, uh, to alternate, have alternative supplies, ways of supplies, uh, to the Baltics and to the, from the Nordic region, from the U.S. and other sources. So it's so that's the way uh, from from here, from the north up to the up to the up to the south. And of course, uh, it's either way in terms of uh, in terms of information exchange, uh, cyber security, uh, financial security, and, uh, and, and 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 much more we can do uh, within the region. Uh, so thanks for this uh, discussion. I'm looking forward to, to further uh, to further projects and, and, and occasions. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much uh, to you because you accepted uh, our invitation and you are willing to to cooperate within this uh, precis uh, think tanks hub that we are trying to 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 create that we are actually now officially uh, announcing. Um, and I hope that we will have a chance and opportunity to organize uh, more frequently this kind of uh, discussions that we can share our opinion and also know that the perspective from different countries. Uh, for us uh, here in the Institute uh, of New Europe, it was very fr fruitful discussion. Uh, so, so now I think we understand the situation a little bit uh, better, knowing also your uh, perspective, knowing your expertise. And uh, I hope that we'll be able to uh, to do very similar discussions and also exchanging of uh, articles, experts uh, in, in the coming uh, weeks and months, uh, because uh, from us to, to make our region stronger is, is also a very, very important issue, especially in, in the face of, of what's uh, happening uh, in Ukraine. So thank you, thank you very much. And 
uh, we hope that our listeners, our viewers also enjoyed the discussion. Thank you.